Uh, good morning, everybody. Today is Thursday, March 8th, 2018. The dates I always put on the videos. And we want to do Kings chapter 21. And those who follow the dating, that's why I give that. Um, today, I did uh, work for about three or so hours in preparation for my other post that I finished up, the teaching post, and did my normal routine. And I usually like to go down by the water, which is very close to me, and I could walk there and teach. And I, because I'm having vehicle problems that should be fixed, I'll do the update on it. When I had uh, fixed my car, which I mentioned the other day, I did it right, the hard stuff, which was taking the double overhead cam off and the left. But because, and when I brought it to Oscar, I showed him, I said, look, Oscar, I redid everything. He didn't think I had done it. He, I said, no, no, I had done the plugs, I did all this. But then he asked me, because it wasn't idling right. He said, did you change the gasket? You're supposed to change the gaskets whenever you pull a Velcro off. Or I said, oh, Oscar, I was kind of in a rush. So that's more than likely the thing. So the work I had done was fine, did all that work. But the simple thing would have been me buying the gasket when I put that back on. And sometimes when you're impatient, and I was. Now, the reason I mention all that is today I've been having somewhat of a battle with somebody that's doing uh, illegal, supposedly it's Google that's going to illegally try to bankrupt me. I don't have, I have about $700 in my checking account, and they're doing some false charge notification of $4,000 withdrawal that's supposed to take place today, and it has to do possibly with the battle I had with YouTube and Google, which is an unnecessary battle. But because of people's bias, politics, all these types of things, you see that happen. So before I start getting into all that, I want to teach this now. And that's why I mentioned that. Now, in Kings 21, we're almost done with Kings, one more chapter. But it's kind of a famous story. There's a man by the name of Naboth who has a vineyard. Nice, like, garden field area. And it's in a city called Jezreel. And King Ahab, after the great victory we saw in the last chapter, and the things that have happened in the history of this wicked king as we close the book of Kings finishing up. Yet he's once again in a position where he's manipulated by his wife Jezebel and he seems to be, he functioned in the last chapter as a king was supposed to function. And God gave him a 7,000 man army and I had mused that maybe it was the righteous remnant that Elijah spoke about, Paul did in the book of Romans. I, there's 7,000 knees in Israel that have not bowed the knee to Baal. And so it seems as if that might have been the high point, the last chapter of Kings, that might have been the high point in Ahab's life where he led this team with these younger commanders, 200 and something, young generation, 7,000 righteous, and they had a great defeat of Benadad, the king of Syria. And it was really, I guess, you could say the best chapter of Ahab, seeing that. But now, once again, back again to his wickedness, if you will. So he contacts this man by the name of Naboth, who lives in a city called Jezreel, which is about 20 miles outside of the capital of the northern kingdom Israel, which was Samaria. Samaria is where Ahab had the capital, and this is the northern tribes of Israel. We've covered that history of the southern Judah and the northern. So this is the northern king again. And he sends a message to this man in Jezreel that he also has a palace, Ahab, or a house as well in Jezreel. It could be a little confusing because Samaria is the capital and this man is in Jezreel, about 20-something miles outside of Samaria. But yet Ahab says, you have a field, a vineyard, that's right next to my palace or my house, which is the other one he had there in the area of Jezreel. And the scripture actually teaches us that in the other, somewhere else. 
and he says, I would like to have your vineyard. I'll either give you money for the vineyard, or I'll just give you a comparable vineyard somewhere else. And Naboth responds righteously, and he says, God forbid that I should give the inheritance of our fathers and our family, and to just sell it or trade it. Now, the Canaanite kings at this history time, kings, they could just go in and take something. But kings of Israel, there was commandments in the scripture that the land to them, this was something that was sacred. It was given to them as God's promise to them, all the way going back to the story of Abraham. And so the land and the division of the land, the initial promised land, the story of Joshua, it wasn't just something that they owned. Oh, I'll trade it, I'll take it, I'll give it. It was different. It was considered like this is a sign that God has been with us. He kept the covenant to Abraham. I'll give you this land, I'll give you this seed, get from your country, from your kindred. So it had a different quality to it at this time. And Naboth responds in a righteous way and says, no, no, this land, this vineyard I have, it's in the family. It's an inheritance. And I would see it as violating God's command to just tr sell it or trade it. Now, what does Ahab do? After Naboth turns down the request, Ahab goes home, lays on the bed, depressed, turns his face away, does not eat. And understand, Ahab has, he's the king, he has a lot of wonderful things. But he couldn't get that other thing. There's so many stories in scripture, uh, famous prophecies of David when David sinned with Bathsheba and Nathan the prophet came and told him a little parable and the parable had to do with this guy had all these sheep but he wasn't satisfied he'd go take somebody else's sheep. And this, we see stories where people that had a lot and then they wanted something from somebody else who had less. And they just wanted to take it and then times took it. And it's interesting because really there was no need for Ahab to be depressed over this. And his wife, Jezebel, comes in and is going to tell him the same thing but in a wicked way. She says to her husband Ahab, what's wrong? Why are you depressed? Why are you laying down? And he tells his wife Jezebel because I have made this request to Naboth, I want his vineyard, and he turned me down. And she's looking at him, laying there in bed, depressed, and says, what, what is wrong with you? You are the king of Israel. Correct? And this is what she hatches the plan. She says, don't worry about it, you're going to get the, if you want the vineyard, I'll get it. But she does it in his name, signs the letters with the king's signet ring, the official proclamation, if you will, subpoenas and all things that we see in our country. And she sends the letters to the elders and nobles of the city of Jezreel, where Naboth lives. And this is what the letters state. Reminds you a little bit of the story I was just alluding to with King David. When he sinned, that was the story where he had Uriah the Hittite, which was the husband of Bathsheba, killed. And he also sent a letter gave it to Uriah and said, when they go to the battle, let this guy go in the front and have him killed. This was like manipulation. This is like official manipulation. We refer to these things as corruption within governments and societies. So Jezebel sends these letters to the elders and nobles of Jezreel and says, and they think it's from Ahab. They think it's from the king. And it says, Get two false witnesses against Naboth. Proclaim the fast, and the King James Bible says, two sons of Belial, basically worthless men who you know have no honor, no integrity, who are going to be willing to just lie on the stand. This is going to be an official court proceeding that they set Naboth up and says, and proclaim the fast. And why proclaim the fast? The letter that Jezebel is sending, it, it gave the impression that there was something, some wrongdoing, like let's find the sin in the camp type of a thing. And so do a fast, seek God, and we'll see where the sin is. It takes you back to some other stories in scripture. And then they said, 
it, it, it gave a sense of urgency and emergency type thing. Like, what's wrong? What's going on? There's a fast. The king of Israel has proclaimed this. And then set Naboth up. Have him go before the people. Have him, if you will, go before the elders and leaders and have these two sons of Belial, these two false witnesses, make a false accusation and say, Naboth blasphemed the king and God, which according to the law of the Old Testament, it, it was a capital offense to do that. And it had to be by the mouth of two or more witnesses. But of course, they're supposed to be witnesses who tell the truth. It's one of the commandments of God. Thou shalt not bear false witness. But these men were willing to do it. So what you're seeing is not just an out-and-out -out murder, but you're seeing false testimony in the judicial system of Israel accomplish a murder. That, that's why false testimony is one of the Ten Commandments that you're not supposed to do that. These two men lie and say Naboth uh, went against God and the king, and the decree is made, and they take him out of the city. I might get into that a little bit. Uh, and they stone him and kill him. Now, in 2 Kings 9, we will read, that this will be recounted, and we'll learn that they also killed Naboth's sons the same day in order to get rid of the inheritance so Ahab could now possess this vineyard that he wants. Now, after this happens, it seems as if the plan worked. Um, let me make a note here. When we read this chapter, by, uh, Preachers and Pastors, we often see the wickedness of Je uh, Jezebel manipulating her husband. We see how the sons of Belial, the false witnesses, did wrong. But we often don't look at the nobles and the elders of that city of Jezreel. I, I see them almost as the worst figures in this chapter because they knew when they got the letter from Jezebel, thinking it was from Ahab, they knew that this was wrong and unjust and wicked. And this was accomplished because the leadership of that small town were afraid. It would be like having the Justice Department come in and say, we're going to look at your city and things like that have happened. Our city had was sued years ago by the Justice Department over hiring practices or something. You see that. And true leadership, even in that city of Jezreel, should have basically rejected this plan that Jezebel hatched. But they went along with it. And I see them as corrupt, colluded with wicked authority. Okay? I'll just give that note. Now, when this is all done, Jezebel goes back to Ahab, who's still crying and weeping. And she says, okay, rise up. I got it for you. It's yours. Oh, great. So he goes to Jezreel, and he's in the vineyard that he wanted. Took it, killed, murdered that righteous man. They both killed his sons on that day and said, now I got it. And it seems like everything works. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And Elijah liked carrying out these tasks. We discussed that. And God, basically, I kind of showed you how I think was giving Elijah lessons. The one post last month or so that Elijah got too comfortable with the fire of judgment. But yet, if you needed someone for this task, this day, Elijah's your man. And the word of the Lord comes to Elijah. It says, rise up. Go have a discussion with Ahab. He's in that vineyard. He's in the place that he killed and he took possession. And sure enough, Elijah goes and confronts Ahab. And Ahab remembers Elijah. Oh, you're my enemy. You have found me. He says, that's right. And then he pronounces this judgment. He says, and because you have done this, which I just explained, your, your family is going to be wiped out. The scripture of King James says, there will not be a man left that pisses against the wall. That's King James. Pisseth against the wall. 
saying, I'm going to cut off your male posterity. And then Elijah mentions something which goes way back to the beginning of Kings. It says, just like the judgment on Jeroboam and Basha, and these were the judgments when we covered the story, that they came under judgment, they died, and their, their inheritance, their posterity, their male children, also were all wiped out. Now understand, in this chapter, that's actually the crime committed against Naboth. They killed him, and I mentioned in 2 Kings 9, they killed his son. They wanted to not only wipe out the father, but all the male line. And that's a judgment, that's a curse. And Elijah pronounces that on Ahab. And, and he says, guess what's going to happen to you? And in the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth, they're also going to lick your blood. And by the way, your wife Jezebel, they're gonna, the dogs are going to eat her body in death by the wall of Jezreel. Now, I've, I'll explain a little bit of this, but this obviously is a prophecy of judgment. And what happens is, Ahab, right at the last few verses, hears this word, and he does something that I don't think Elijah was happy with, just like Jonah and the Ninevites. After all this wickedness, the word of the Lord again comes to Elijah, judgment, and it's a tough prophecy. And then Ahab repents, puts on sackcloth, ashes, fasts, and then God says to Elijah, now you see Ahab, you see how he humbled himself? Because of this, I will delay the judgment. That's interesting. And I think that end of the chapter once again is also assigned to Elijah, showing him, see, I want repentance. That's what it, the scripture says God is not a man that he should repent. And some that scholars and all, they said, okay, but in the story, by the way, that I just mentioned of Jonah, Jonah did not want to go and preach to the Ninevites because he knew that they would repent. And Jonah was a prophet, but he didn't want to see those Ninevites, those people in the story of Jonah, repent. And so you have God saying, there are times where when God sold repentance, it says God never changes his mind. But if God pronounces judgment, the purpose of that pronouncement is to bring repentance. That's the godly sorrow work of repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, Paul says in Corinthians. So at the end, that's like that little lesson for Elijah. Now let me try to cover how that this judgment was carried out because Elijah pronounced this judgment in Kings 21. Uh, the dogs are going to lick your blood, Ahab. In that same field, now this is the area of Jezreel, okay? They're going to lick your blood in that field. And the dogs are going to eat the body of your dead wife, too, by the wool of Jezreel. But, God said at the end, because he repented, I'll put it off until the days of his son, Ahab's sons. Now, in the next chapter as we finish Kings, we're going to read that Ahab gets killed in Ramoth Gilead. They bring him back to Samaria, and the dogs are going to lick the blood of Ahab from his chariot. So that's a partial fulfillment. But what about the blood? Your blood being licked, if you will, in that city of Jezreel in the field. Second Kings 9, again, I'll probably add my commentary on that chapter, which I wrote before. The son of Ahab by the name of Joram is going to be the ultimate fulfillment of that judgment. Because it happens in the days of the sons, and Joram is going to be killed. And if I remember right, they throw his body in the field of Naboth. Okay? So, the blood of Ahab, your blood, it's going to be spilled there where the innocent blood of Naboth, but that part's fulfilled through the bloodline of Ahab, his son Joram. But yet, the dogs do lick the blood from the chariot, and eventually these judgments are carried out. Okay? Um, well, we have one chapter left of Kings, 
And by now, when you see this video, you should be able to see. Let me look at it. The dogs. I think I covered it all. You should be able to see uh, Colossians. I think I'm going to start Colossians. All right. Uh, lessons in leadership. Lessons. You know, we try to ding things out of this. Uh, it says. It tells us also in this chapter how Jezebel, the wicked wife of Ahab, how she stirred him up. She, her hand and her role in all of these things. He married her as, if you will, a pagan woman, introduced idolatry, and she worked her way into the system in order to use it in an ungodly and an unrighteous way. And so the sin of Ahab was wicked and sinful, and also how she manipulated. Now, in the New Testament and in the book of Revelation, it says things like, Thou sufferest that woman Jezebel to seduce my servants, to commit fornication. The name of Jezebel goes down in history as like a Jezebel. A lot of people are familiar with the connotation of that. She's considered, and there have been many that have written books and then the spirit of Jezebel, manipulation, and so forth, but because of her manipulation, that's really what her wickedness is, okay? That's what her, the way she manipulated the system. And there are some key stories in scripture where we see this. I'll just mention one off the cuff. I'm almost done here. But in the execution of John the Baptist, you had Herod the king at that time who feared John the Baptist. And the daughter of Herod's wife, he married his brother Philip's wife, and John the Baptist used to prophesy, Herod, you're married to your brother Philip's wife, and it's wrong, it's wicked, it's sin. And the wife didn't like hearing that. But yet, Herod was the king. He had the official signet ring, if you will. And one day, the famous story of the execution of John, one day, Salome, the daughter of Herod's wife, but not his daughter, okay, like the stepdaughter, she does the sensual dance for the king, sort of like a club, you know, strip club type thing, uh, how far it went, I don't know, but that's kind of what she was doing, and Herod says, I'll give you the, up to half of my kingdom, what do you want, and, and Salome, the daughter, stepdaughter, asks her mom, this is now in the New Testament, and the mom says, oh, tell your stepdad, I want the head of John the Baptist brought to me on a platter. Now that wife, that mother, manipulated. She was unable to personally execute John, and she hated that man. But she manipulated to have the authority of the king do that. And when the daughter told Herod, oh, here's the request. Give me the head of John. He was in prison, he was in jail. And Herod was sad, it says. Nevertheless, because of, for the oath's sake and for the people that were there. Like, oh, I'm gonna make this impression. See, like the leaders of Naboth, the leaders of Jezreel. Instead of doing what was just and right, they said, oh, we gotta, we got the other picture to look at, our economy here. And so sure enough, John was executed. They took his head off. And that's how that was for, and that's kind of what this Jezebel thing is. That's kind of what it le uh, talk, stands for in Scripture. That the manipulation of the system is a wicked thing. Okay, so this is second to last chapter. Next time we'll finish Kings. And I just pray a blessing on everybody. I thank you for, the, for all of our friends. Everyone that has come this far on the journey where a lot has happened here over the years. I just pray that the word of the Lord will go out. That the scripture talks about let your doctrine drop down like rain, let your speech distill like dew. That everyone would receive it, these words. And so that's the authority we have in the kingdom. It's through the word of the Lord. I just pray in this uh, beautiful place here that the word of the Lord would go forth and that you'd bless your people. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.